All right. Well, everybody, welcome to our Monday night call. Um, I love these calls and just the special guests that we have on every single week. Um, sometimes it's some of our platinum founders who have been preparing some things um, to teach us. And tonight we have a very special guest. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. Um, his name's not Diane Harper, I promise. I know it's on his thing, but it's Dr. Dennis Harper. And I'm going to um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about him. So he has been in general medical practice since 1986, being devoted to the practice of traditional and complementary medicine. He's semi-retired. He was the student body president of his medical school and has been a voting member of the American Osteopathic Association. He was the president of Physicians for Progressive Medicine and was the second vice president for the Utah Osteo Osteopathic Association. Um, Dr. Harper was a member of the Unproven Medical Practice Committee for the Utah Medical Association, and my favorite, he was one of three doctors <clears throat> that initially spoke to Senator Orrin Hatch to implement the DSHEA, which is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, and this act saved the health food industry from severe overregulation. Um, by the FDA. That was just a huge deal here um, and everywhere. He was a member of the licensing board for the state of Utah for four years and was the chairman um, this the last year and a fellow for the Federation of State Medical Boards. He was also the chairman and member of the Isogenic Scientific Advisory Board for Isogenics International. He is the author of four books, um, which I've read some of them. Um, one of them is Cleansing for Life, Nature's Best Kept um, Health Secret. Another one is More Than Convinced. The other one is Why Diets Are Failing Us. He's a co-author to that. And The Lazarus Effect. He's been married to his sweetheart, maybe even longer now. I don't know if this is an old bio, but for 47 years um, to beautiful Diane and three adult children and six grandchildren. And Dr. Harper, welcome to our call tonight. It's such a joy to have you here. I am happy to be here. I'm tickled pink that you invited me. And we're so, yes, and we're so excited that you are here now um, with us as Levo and to really um, take a look. I love when you tell the story of being able to, oh, that they opened everything to you, like all the book, all the um, ingredients and everything. So I'll have you expound a little bit on that throughout your story. Um, but tonight, I'm super excited for our call tonight and, you know, what it's all about, about the obesity epidemic. Um, I don't know if any, if all of you know, or you, some of you don't know, but I've struggled with this my entire life. I started my first diet when I was in the third grade, when the school nurse told me I was one fat little kid and needed to go home and get on a diet. And I was, I was 142 pounds in third grade. And um, it was that day that I started my first diet. My mom put me on Weight Watchers and throughout my entire life, it's just been a struggle diet after diet after diet um, until I found the concept, the concept of fasting and fueling. And I was able to release over 130 pounds and over COVID I gained a little bit back, but just since July 3rd, I'm down 17 pounds and I'm on 48 hours of my fast and I'm just, I'm feeling so good. And it's, it's crazy how much it is a mindset. It's a mindset game and to be able to get your head back in the place to to be consistent um, with whatever you know program you're going to be on, um, but I know in my heart of hearts that we are in the right place at the right time with this incredible nutrition and with Dr. Harper here um, to be one of the people that really um, make makes sure that our formulations are the best of the best and no compromise for sure. And I love Dr. Harper that you're able to see everything in them. And, um, and I'm just, I'm going to turn it over to you to explain the truth and solutions really about this obesity epidemic um, that I am so passionate about as an adult and from coming from childhood obesity. Um, it's a true passion of mine. So welcome to the call. I'm so excited you're here and I'm going to turn it over to you and Robert. Robert's going to um, do the slides for you. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm really grateful that I'm with Zalabo as well because it's such a transparent company. And that's something that I haven't been used to in the past. And so it's nice to be able to see 
every single ingredient that goes into every single Zalevo product and know where they came from, know how they're sourced, know just it, it's so refreshing. And and I think uh, Zalevo has the right idea here. That's given premium products because when you start dumbing down products, what happens? You start dumbing down the results. And so that's the last thing that Zaleva wants to do. They want to maintain a good quality product that will give people good quality results. So let's let's go ahead and get those uh, slides up. And then we'll take a look and see what uh, if I can remember all of these things or not. But uh, obesity is not something that's new. Obviously, <laughs> it's been around for a long time. And uh, quite frankly, it's, uh, yeah, we need to get onto the very first slide there. Yeah, I'm getting there. Sorry, I was a little into the process. So here we go, Dr. Harper. Okay, okay, good. So when you're seeing um, obesity is not something new. And quite frankly, I did this a couple of years ago saying, are we making any headway with obesity? And let's just kind of go to the next slide real fast. And let's just kind of see how it's defined. And you can see that a body mass index that's between 30 to 34 is considered to be a class one obesity. 35 to 39, class two, and above 40 is a class three. Well, you can see by this that this is a fairly simple way of determining obesity. Now, this is not the way I like it. This is, uh, well, the National Institutes of Health defines morbid, more, uh, morbid obesity as being 100 pounds or more above your ideal body weight. So how do you figure out your ideal body weight? You figure out your, your height times five pounds, uh, and that... Uh, so you get, uh, let me back that up. You get a hundred pounds for the first five feet and then five pounds for every inch thereafter. Okay. Now, if you're a man, then you start out at 105 pounds and five, uh, five pounds for every inch thereafter of five feet. So I can give you your ideal body weight. However, BMI is something that's measured. They take your total body weight and they take your uh, total height and then they kind of divide it and say, this is where your BMI is. As far as I'm concerned, the BMI is pretty rudimentary and not really what we need to take a look at. Let's go to the next slide because this is what I really would like people to see. I, I've never heard that scale, by the way, 100 pounds and then up to five feet and then one pound for every. every yeah, it's, every it's 100 pounds for the first five feet and then five pounds for every inch thereafter. Interesting. Okay. Now, then the insurance industry allows you and then you, they give you a, a plus or minus 15 percent. Okay. On that. Okay, this is what I actually like to see better because this gives a, a really a much truer evaluation of what's going on in a person's body. So you can see for men, the essential fat, that means we have to have some fat. Now you see these guys that are professional bodybuilders, holy smokes, I'm not sure they even have 5% fat because you can see every single muscle is in their, uh, in their body. But the essential fats are two to 5%, which means you start going below that, you start running into some little health risks. Athletes, six to 13. Average people, 18 to 24%. That's for men, okay? Well, that's not bad. But if you get above 24%, then, then that's a considered to be obese. So you want to watch the fat uh, content of your body more than necessarily the total weight. And for women, you can see on the other side, women tend to have, be a little more fat. And that's there's some good reasons for that. Uh, but uh, it has a lot to do with hormones, obviously. Uh, and they give you 32% is and above is considered to be obese. So you kind of can see that right there that it uh, is indeed a better way of measuring what your body is. Now, the, on the next, don't move to the next slide yet, but on the next slide, I'm going to show you a 350 pound woman, okay, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, let's show the next slide. Hang on, before we show that slide, it's, it's quite, it's not what you think. So <laughs> here we go. I love this next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, setting it up, Andre. Yep, this next slide. She weighs a th 350 pounds. Now I dare any of you to tell me that she's obese. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, you can see nobody is going to be concerned with her weight at 350 pounds. And this goes back to right again. What is the percent of body fat that you're carrying in your body? That's the real critical issue because I've had patients that were uh, 60, 70, 100 pounds overweight, but their muscle mass was really up there as well. And their fat percentage was very, very low. Okay, let's go on to the, the next uh, slide. So Dr. Harper, it's more about body composition. 
Yes, it is. Absolutely. Body composition is the key. It's not the weight. Okay. All right. Now, this is what I was taught in medical school. This was very simple. <laughs> and there's been studies after studies that have disproven this, but it just said, no, obesity results when someone regularly takes in more calories than needed. That is a very simplistic view of obesity. Now, let's go to the next slide because we're going to show that that really is only a very small part. If you look in the right down here on the on the right hand side, you can see that, yeah, if you're consuming uh, high, well, actually, that's even wrong. A high fat diet should be deleted there. I don't know how that got in there because high fat diets are bad only if they're the wrong types of fat. If you're on a high fat diet, interestingly enough, your body's going to respond by burning fat. So dis disregard that. Uh, but uh, if you start on the top left, we're going to look at energy intake more than is needed. That goes along with what I was taught in medical school. Uh, thrifty genes. Okay. Yes, there are people. And we'll talk about genes a little bit here as well in regards to, are you a Clydesdale or are you a Shetland pony? Okay. A Shetland pony is never going to be able to be a Clydesdale and vice versa, no matter what you do, because there's going to be a genetic factor there. And then you can see endocrine diseases, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, growth hormone deficiency, polycystic ovarian disease. There's a whole lot of other things that can enter into obesity. So you have to be kind of careful with this because it's not a simple thought. I mean, you, next one is drugs. What drugs are you taking? Uh, uh, there, there's so many drugs that actually interfere with your basal metabolic rate, like beta blockers. Uh, not a good idea. Uh, estrogens will interfere with that. So it's, it's, you have to be careful with those as well. And then uh, mental and physical disabilities, you can read through that. Uh, social factors, reduction in exercise, absolutely, sure. If we're sedentary, we tend to lose what we don't use. If you've heard this a million times, and it's absolutely true. Sedentary lifestyles, yes, if you're gonna end up creating more problems for your body. TV, yeah, in fact, they uh, once estimated that if you're watching more than, oh, now don't hold me to these figures, but. They estimate if you're watching more than four hours of TV a day, it's the equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes. So it's like, okay, let's let's get away from the TV as much as we possibly can. The same thing goes with computer games, uh, sedentary jobs, which I unfortunately was one of those because I was a physician and you just essentially sit all day long and talk to your patients. So it's a problem. Uh, and interesting that they say fat children become fat adults. Now, why do you think that is taking place generally? It's because of possibly a chromosomal problem, a genetic problem, uh, or it could be the fact that the parents are feeding the child incorrectly. And we're gonna get more into this a little bit later. Okay, pregnancy, obviously. Every woman that's been pregnant realizes they're gonna gain weight on that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. It's the same thing, essentially, but let's talk in the top right floor or the right side where it says bowel flora imbalance. This is a kind of a, a brand new concept that's only been around for maybe three to four years where they're finding out that, that the uh, bacteria that's in our digestive system actually affects our entire bodies it, uh, because of the, the chemicals that are being released by the bacteria that grows there. And we found that there are certain types of bacteria that make mice fat and there's certain types of bacteria that make mice thin. Now, nobody's really done the studies yet, to my knowledge, that applied this to human beings yet, but it's a very interesting idea, and the fact that it's been demonstrated in mice kind of lends the credibility there that it will certainly do the same thing with humans. Uh, we talked about genetics, too much TV, high, oh, high-carbohydrate diets. Now, back in the 80s, or even before that, in the 70s, the government was trying to push high-carbohydrate diets because everybody was afraid of fat. Okay. Oh, don't eat eggs. Oh my gosh. There's so much cholesterol in it. It's terrible. And, and if you look at, there was one graph that came out showing the consumption of margarine and from the, about the 1920s, and it showed also the rate of heart disease. And if you put those two together, they exactly parallel each other. Okay. So they were trying to get people away from butter because of the fat content in butter and margarine was so much better. Well, the margarine wasn't better because it was all loaded full of trans fatty acids. And our body doesn't use trans fatty acids, it uses a cis form. 
And so it's like a mirror image, like your hands are mirror images. Well, the cysts and the trans are mirror images, but they don't stick together very well. So they rupture cells, walls, and then they cause lipid peroxidation and lots of free radicals and it ages your body prematurely. So that's why we started seeing a lot of heart disease associated with that. Now in the recent years, I think, what has it been? eight years, maybe 10 years, the federal government's finally come out and said, we don't want trans fatty acids anymore in the foods. And so now that's actually on the labels now. So that's kind of nice. Uh, insulin resistance. Now, this is a big one. This is a ginormous one because it goes right along with high carbohydrate diets or high glycemic index foods would be a better idea because as you're eating high glycemic index foods, what takes place is the insulin levels go up to try to deal with those high glycemic index foods. And then eventually what happens is you start developing insulin resistance, which means you have to have more and more insulin to get the sugar out of the bloodstream into the cells where it can be utilized for energy. And since it gets more, more and more difficult, what it does is it takes that excess sugar and turns it into a triglyceride and that gets stored as fat. So if you're insulin, and this is one reason why we see diabetics almost universally start gaining weight as they start using insulin products is because it turns the excess sugar into triglycerides. And then of course, the heavier they become, the more insulin resistance they become. And it just, it continues on a, a not a very good spiral. Leptin resistance, uh, same type of a situation here. Leptin is the one that says, you know what, I'm full. Now, it's important to realize that there, there's two ways that you're full, okay? You can tell when your stomach's full. I mean, I, it's like, oh, wow, I, I, I can tell my stomach's full. But your brain hasn't turned off and is telling you, you know what, I'm still hungry. I mean, my stomach's not hungry, but I'm still hungry. And that has a lot to do with leptin resistance and also uh, 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 being addicted to certain types of foods, especially sugars. So. Uh, you, you, you'll find that as you change your diet, you'll suddenly realize, oh, I'm full. I've, I've had plenty of food, but I'm still hungry. And it's because your body has not adapted yet, or you may have that leptin resistance. So you have to be careful with that. Now, another thing, as you go to the center, you look at hypothyroidism. That's a really, really common disease. Much, it's very much underappreciated. And you have to look at special, special tests. Now, when in medical school, I was taught, you just do a TSH and a T4 and you're pretty much good to go. But the T4 does not run your body. Your, your body has to transform T4 into T3 for it to become effective. Otherwise, it only, only has about a third the activity of what T3 has. So it's important to do a TSH and a free T3 to find out how much is actually available in your body. And for me, I like my patients to be between uh, 3.2 to 3.5, but then the normals run from two to 4.2. So it's like, there's a big range of quote normal, but when they're on below three, it makes me worry. And then another one, sleep apnea. I can't tell you how many of my patients that I've had that when we did just a simple little test, like a nocturnal pulse oximetry, uh, we're finding out that their oxygen levels are going down at night. And consequently, that means they're fighting death. And as they're fighting death, what's taking place is they're also causing a lot of stress in their body. And stress, of course, causes weight gain because of the cortisol. So you end up seeing a lot of people that have sleep apnea because they are overweight. And you also see people that are underweight that have sleep apnea that can actually gain weight because of that sleep apnea. And some sometimes you have to get rid of the weight before you can get rid of the sleep apnea. So it's it's a, an interesting situation, but it's a simple test. Nocturnal pulse oximetry test. You can get that from almost any oxygen supply company and they'll give you the results. Now, if they say you have to have a doctor order, it, just get your friendly doctor to order it for you. You don't have to go in and see him about it. Just if he won't do it, find another doctor because the doctor should be on your side. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Dr. Harper, it's okay. We asked you questions as well. Fire away, you bet. Okay, and Jill, I'm sure you maybe have some as well. So one of mine was on the uh, the trans fats. You know, I grew up in uh, the deep south where a healthy breakfast was biscuits and gravy. You know, and the gravy was made with Crisco, etc. You 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 speedily ran through what a trans fat does, explodes this or does something. Could you could you uncover that a little more in layman's terms? Sure. Let's uh, let's let's say you got a puzzle. Okay. No, no, let's just use hands because that's easy. It, these are isomers, okay? You got a right hand and a left hand, 
Okay, that's the same thing as a cis and a trans fat. They have this, the same molecular shape, except it's a mirror image. All right. All right. You said a trans fat. What's the other word? Cis. C I S. Oh, C I S. I've never heard that word before. And what does yeah, cis represent? It, it's once again, that's the kind that our body utilizes the cis form. Oh, it's it the use, okay. Yeah, for us to make cells, we use the cis form. We don't use the trans forms. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And so when you put transforms and cis forms together, they kind of fit, but they don't. And so then it's very easy to have a, cell, a cellular rupture or the, the cell membrane just kind of goes over oh, too weak and pops. And when it pops, that cell dies. And when that cell dies, then it causes lipid peroxidation, which is a major uh, producer of free radicals in your body. So it's not a good idea. In fact, the, the original researcher that found out about trans fats he did it like, oh my gosh, let me think about this. I think he found out about it in 1970. And, and don't hold me to these figures because it's been too long since I've really remembered these. But he, just as a researcher, found out, oh yeah, transforms are not very good for our body. So the makers of the Criscos and things like that, they funneled money into him to change his research in a different direction. And so it took almost another 20 years for it to come out. Wow. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, you just, it's just tough to think that people are that, that weird, but yeah, it happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, that may be uh, guided by other motives, you know? So I, I still don't, how can, how can that fight battle between the, the, the good, the cis, the good fats and the trans, create a cell rupture. Sorry, I, I don't mean to go off in the weeds, but I just want to understand okay. how that. Let's, um, let's make it with bricks, okay? You have a regular brick like this, okay? And then a transform would be like this. And so you, you can't stack them correctly. So you have spaces in between those bricks. And what that does is the cell doesn't like spacing like that. It likes a nice, tight, coherent cell. And that way it keeps the, the, the fluids in and the fluids out. And so it, it kind of acts as a little uh, a defense mechanism for the cell to do what it needs to be doing without outside interference. Uh, but when you start stacking and having these little holes in your cell wall from the trans fats, then they tend to rupture very easily. Okay, so it creates so much, yeah, trauma or whatever on the cell wall, it, it tends to create these. Right, it, it just, it, it doesn't fit well. And so you end up with a very weak cell wall and it ruptures. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That is wow. And, and it, don't, don't you think that there's so much, so much of our food out there that we purchase has so many trans fats along with the sugar. I know along with other things, but that's a big, big component, so. They pretty much changed. Almost all the oils out there now are no longer trans oils. Ah, but still, yeah. the oil that I like the best is olive oil, uh, coconut oil, and butter. Okay, those are the three that I like the very best. Now You're with right. butter, you have to be a little bit careful. And the reason, because butter, when an animal consumes toxins and chemicals and things like that, where are those things stored? They're stored in, in fat tissues in the body. Butter is a fat tissue. Oh, In fact, wow. there was a person that wrote a book called, uh, what was it? Diet for an unhealthy planet or diet for a poison planet. I can't remember exactly what it was, but one of the top five foods that he, that the FDA showed had more toxins in it than anything else. Well, one of them was butter. Huh. Wow. And I guess what another one was. What? Raisins. Oh, yes. Because they're sprayed, right? And then it just kind of seeps in. Because or? raisins. And I heard coffee was full. And have you ever seen a dried grape? Yeah, it's a raisin. Yes, but have you ever <laughs> seen a real dried grape? Yes. Do they look shiny and black? No. No, they don't. So what are they doing to these dried grapes? At that time, they were spraying them with trans fatty acids to make them look pretty, okay? So it's like, ah, uh, not a good idea. Another thing was um, bass, largemouth bass. Now, we don't have too many of those in the state of Utah, but back in Oklahoma where I grew up and I used to go fishing in farm ponds all the time, well, 
the meanest and the nastiest fish in the pond is a largemouth bass. So it was at the top of the food chain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it would, the smaller things would eat other smaller things. And eventually big mouth bass, he ate everything. Okay. So his flesh was loaded with the toxins because he was at the top of the food pyramid. Now, are we at the top of our food chain? I was just thinking that. So. <laughs> okay. So knowing that, that we're at the top of our food chain, we've done the same thing largemouth bass do. And so if there's one thing that you, I absolutely want you to remember this. If nothing else, remember this. Don't ever, ever eat another human being. We're way too toxic. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> that is good to know. Hey, can you, what about avocado oil? Is that one Great. okay? Yeah, okay. avocado oil is fine. Perfect. And then Scott and Dennis, I did see your questions, but we're going to cover those at the end. So, okay, let's keep moving. Okay, okay. Let's go to the next slide. I know I could, I could talk with you. I'm sure we all could for the next hour. Just <laughs> on this one slide. That's okay with me. Hey, There's we can go any direction you guys want to go. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. How about we cruise through and come back? There's so many questions here. I, I, I don't know what the heck a T3 and T4 is. I sleep apnea. Is it cortisol? Okay. <laughs> we, we, well, we can cruise. We, we can yeah, go. Let's, yeah. Okay. Let's let's cruise on. Okay. I'm not the only one who has questions here. So come on. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. This was the cost. This is the estimated cost of obesity. And this was in 2008 for the first one and 2020. For the second one, and you can see, we spent $147 billion in 2008 and $184 billion in 2020 on obesity-related items. Wow. This is not a cheap disease. This is an expensive disease. And so we have to be very, very careful and realize that, well, there's more reasons than that. I mean, if you look at COVID, okay, what was the number one factor for determining mortality rates? Obesity. Obesity. Okay, that was one of the highest mortality rates. If you're obese and you get COVID, you're in trouble. So it's like, understand that obesity affects all kinds of disease processes in our body. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, when I went, took my wife to Italy for a, an anniversary one time and we saw uh, da Vinci's statue of David and it was absolutely beautiful. Well, apparently they sent uh, the statue of David on a tour in the United States for six months. And the next slide shows how it went back to Italy. <laughs> I, I just can't even look. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, before and after. Yeah, not, not the right direction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now we're going to show something that uh, since 1985, the CDC has been keeping track of the rates of obesity. I want you to look right in the bottom left-hand corner where it shows, uh, oh, less than 10% and 10 to 14%. Okay, that, those are the rates. So you can see the blue correlates with the states that had 10 to 14% obesity. Okay, now we're going to go through this a little fast, but just keep track of what this is. Okay, let's go to the next one, 1986. You can see the changes, 1987, 1988, 1989, 1990, 1991, and all of a sudden, look at the bottom. They came up with a new category, 15 to 19%. Okay, so let's go on, keep on going, 92. 93, 94, 95, 96, uh-oh. Now we have, if you look down there again, we have another category greater than 20%, okay? Let's keep going. 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2000, keep going. Oh boy, this time it only took four years instead of six years. It went up to greater than 25%. Let's keep going. You'll keep seeing the states as they now they put it in red, obviously, because now they're really concerned. So let's keep going. And you can just see the progression of obesity in the United States through the years. Just keep going. Just keep it going. What now, see? what do you see? A new category. A new category. Once again, greater than 30%. Okay. Let's just keep going. We're going to run through this quickly because this... 
I know you guys have some questions. Let's go to the next one. Okay, this shows uh, the prevalence of obesity. Uh, this has to do with, uh, and you can go down there now, they've got a greater than 35%. And uh, let's just keep going. These next three slides kind of talk about uh, non-Hispanic white adults, and then it talks about Hispanics, and then it talks about uh, uh, African Americans. And it shows the difference that apparently people with color seem to have a little bigger problem with obesity, which is unfortunate. But then and you also look down in the Deep South, and the Deep South, hey, barbecue, deep fried everything. I mean, and I love it. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's great, but unfortunately it, it adds to this. Okay, um, now let's go to the next slide. We need to ask the North Dakotans, the Maine and the Vermonters, what do you think? Well, they've got insufficient data. For some reason they didn't turn it in. And we don't know what's going on there. Yeah. And if you go back a couple of slides, you'll see that they are not immune. So go back a couple of slides. There you go. Gotcha. Now you can see. Okay. So oh, this. Yes. All right. Now let's go forward again. Now, this is the thing that's very interesting. Okay. They're projecting that by 2030, 50% of the population will be obese. Okay. That is just horrible. Okay. So you've got to, you've got to start looking at it. And you can see that it's not changing. You can see right now from 1960s all the way up to 2010, and they haven't even, they're showing the continual progression of, a, of the United States becoming more and more obese. And it's not just the United States, it's the entire world. And Dr. Harbour, it's not the lack of knowledge. For, we've never been, we've never had knowledge more accessible to, today than any time in history. It's not that. You well, know. you have to remember the federal government for many, 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 many years promulgated high carbohydrates. If they had their food pyramid, it was a base. The base was carbohydrates, okay? It should be upside down. You should flip that around and that's the way it should be. Should have more proteins, more good fats. And remember, good fats and, and much, many, many, uh, hard, well, low carbohydrate diets are very, very critical. And let me explain the reasons for that. Not only is it the insulin resistance, but as you're eating high glycemic index foods, the insulin levels go up. But when the insulin levels go up, so does arachidonic, or arachidonic acid levels go up. Now, arachidonic acid pushes prostaglandin synthesis into prostaglandin E2, which is an inflammatory prostaglandin. So it increases inflammation in your body. That's not a good thing. We want to be pushing it into prostaglandin E1 or E3, not E2. So uh, low carbohydrates is a really good idea. In fact, the Zone Diet came out many years ago where he didn't want any more than 40% uh, carbohydrates and uh, the rest in fats and proteins. And he didn't want to be consuming more than 600 calories at a time. And then, of course, the Atkins diet's been out there forever. And the Atkins diet essentially is really a good, good diet. People do very, very well with it as far as losing weight. The problem is I don't think genetically we are designed to stay on a ketotic state forever. So I get a little concerned with that. Eskimos, yes, because their, their consumption of fat is like, oh gosh, a slip of like 88% of their, their, their uh, meals prior to us go, taking carbohydrates up there was fat. They have like 22 different ways of describing fat and the rest of it, of course, was protein. So they genetically, they can deal with that. I'm not sure genetically we can deal with long-term ketosis, mm. but uh, it, it's, a, it's a possibility. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Or maybe that's the end. I think that's the end there, yeah. Oh, that's the end, good. So now we can take questions. Awesome, okay. Um, all right, let me go to the chat. We have a question. Um, oh, there we are. Oh, we're over here now. Okay. So Scott Lucas is on here tonight. He's pretty thin. So he said, I have a low BMI per my scale at 12.5 using all master formulations. I'm thin except around my belly. Any thoughts? Yeah. In fact, the older we get, we start developing a belly. In fact, you'll see this in animals as well. You, you, if you, any animal, as it gets older and older, you'll start seeing more and more belly fat accumulating. Now, you, the thing that you have to be concerned with is whether or not it's external belly fat or internal be belly fat. The internal belly fat is really, really bad for us, okay? It causes increased oxidation, increased uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases and things like that. 
with your BMI at 12. Now, here's another possible problem here. There's been just one or two studies out that have actually shown that people that are on the higher BMI side uh, tend to live a little longer. Now, this is, this is kind of brand new stuff, and I'm not talking about into the obesity range. I'm just talking about on the higher side of normal. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm not sure that that's going to be proven to be effect, uh, the, the case with additional studies or not, but it was interesting that we saw one or two of those studies come out showing that, yeah, maybe we need to be just a little bit heavier to maintain our, our health. So, but once again, it would fall within the normal BMI range. But yeah, the belly fat, hormones is a big one because we start, start seeing a lack of DHEA and testosterone in men and we start developing a little punch. If you're drinking beer, that's another reason. Please don't be drinking beer uh, because that'll definitely do it as well. Uh, and then if you're uh, watching everything else, uh, I, I wouldn't be too terribly concerned about a little tiny bit of belly fat because it doesn't sound like you've got much if you're down around 12%, 12, 12 so, uh, or, or your BMI is 12. So I, I can't imagine that would be a, much of a problem. Scott, Deb loves you anyway. Like your, your little pooch, we're, we're good with it. We're good. Look at them kiss. That was the best. That was great. Um, okay, so the next one is from Dennis McCarthy. Implementing fueling and fasting, how long to overcome insulin resistance like a ballpark? Well, the book that I read, and it's the same one that uh, has been out for <laughs> In fact, Jim uh, introduced us to this book. <clears throat> uh, he said that it, you can recover very quickly from insulin resistance, but it, once again, it goes back. How do you recover from it? Stop eating carbohydrates, okay? That's the, the, the critical issue right there is the high glycemic index foods. If you get away from those, your body seems to recover fairly quickly with insulin resistance. Now, with leptin resistance, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, but with insulin resistance, it, it seems to recover very quickly. And I can't tell you a time limit. I can't remember. Jim, do you remember the time limit? Hang on, yeah, Jim. He's on mute. Yeah, well, well, he just said, this was a BYU professor, that he just said that, uh, no, it, it tends to recover very quickly if you stay away from high glycemic index foods. Right. And, and it's also, if I could just add that, and great research in that book and, and talking about insulin resistance is that the, the cells can start to heal themselves while you're in ketosis because you're using less insulin to deliver your glucose. In fact, in ketosis, suddenly, yeah, why we get sick. That's Dr. The book. Benjamin. If you're interested, Bigman. this one will give you all the information you need about that. He was seeing people in six months absolutely doing marvelous our intermittent fasting that that's exactly what that's accomplishing because you're in ketosis during that right. but then you're getting the rest of the benefit of the autophagy of the reboot of all of the broken and harmful cells yep okay I love that. Okay, so the next question, um, well, and really quick, going back to Scott's belly fat, there are biome sink um, trim. Doesn't it have, Dr. Herbert, doesn't it have like all the studies and stuff around it that it helps with that, the visceral fat, the fat around our organs? And it, what I'm, I missed that question. Would you say the that biome one? sink trim? Yes, it, it does. In, in the mice, it has shown a reduction in visceral fat. And so, yes, that's one of the reasons why we have it is because we think that there is going to be a translation into human beings as well with that. And so I would, yeah, I, I take it. <laughs> I do too. Okay, perfect. Okay, next question. What are your thoughts about the issue? The issue is more about the lack or low skeletal muscle. Low what? Skeletal muscle. Oh, um, skeletal muscle? Yes. Well, that, generally, when you have low skeletal muscle, what takes place is it's because you're not exercising. You're being sedentary somewhere. If you're not being sedentary, if you're out being active, you're going to have a lot more skeletal muscle that you can be, uh, be um, building. I mean, I, I haven't worked out this last week, but I generally try to work out with weights three times a week. 
And it's not weights. I don't like free weights, but I do like uh, like the bow flex where you, you have a hard time hurting yourself with that. I don't know. Way to go, Scott. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask this question for me um, because I have PCOS and I've had it, you know, since I they diagnosed it when I was really young, and I I think that could have contributed to my childhood obesity. Yeah, um, but I also was talking to my mom the other day, and because I played all star soccer, I was on the farm, like I was active all the time. I wasn't one of those kids that just stayed home and you know didn't do much. So. I was raised on a cherry orchard and I, we would harvest cherries all night long. And I told my mom, I said, we were breathing those fumes in from the tractors like all night long. And my dad would be out there spraying all the cherry trees, all 75 acres. And we'd just be out there playing in the orchard and he'd have on all like his suits to protect him, but we didn't have anything. So I just, I want to hear from you. Like, could that have contributed to like when you take toxins in don't you produce the fat cells to enroll those toxins yes you, you that's where remember that's where you store toxins is in fat tissues and so okay. if you're being over that's one of the ways that the body has of protecting you from toxins is it tends to enrobe those toxins in in a, a fat tissue that means that it's then hidden from the body okay now unfortunately when you start losing weight what are you going to be doing that's why some people get sick when they start losing weight yeah, okay. but that's why it's important to drink lots of water and stuff like that, so we can flush that out when you're when you're actually doing things like this. And the burn mode doesn't that help go in and get the impurities? I mean, tell me a little bit more about why our burn mode is so impactful in fasting and fueling. Well, we're trying to give you everything that your body needs without giving it a lot of uh, protein, because the protein unfortunately will kick you out of autophagy. I would say what we're giving you is a lot of antioxidants, major amount of antioxidants, so that it can protect your body from the toxins that are being released. It gives you the, your body the opportunity with the water to flush those things out. Because remember, toxins, what do they create? Free radicals. Okay, so we want to make sure that, that you've got enough protection against the free radicals in the burn mode to help you there, as well as uh, giving you some good... Uh, uh, Nutrients. I mean, you've got uh, you've got the vitamins, you've got the uh, two sources of minerals, and you've got uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of uh, just say all the things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing in there that's that's <laughs> that is not designed to help your body. Okay, we don't put fluff in there. Yeah. I love that. Okay, a question. To, thank you for answering. I just had to have a breakthrough from my childhood obesity. And since my mom and I were talking about the other day, I'm like, I'm going to ask Dr. Harper on this call. Um, the next question that came in, um, I, I was always, oh, there's another one. Is it safe to fast weekly or is it more beneficial to keep changing it up? Wow, that's going to be a, an individual. We need to talk about individual bodies here too. This is really important. You guys have heard me tell this a million times, but the chances of anybody having the same biochemistry set that you have is four times four, 10 million times. Now that's a number that is so large that I had a, a math major at BYU. He came into my office. He said, uh, what do you want me to do this next week? I said, I want you to tell me how big this number is four times four, 10 million times. And so he uh, said, oh, piece of cake, no problem. Came back the next week. He said, well, I tried it on my calculator. That didn't work. So I tried it on my computer, exceeded the capacity of my computer. So I had to do it longhand. And he said, and I'm not really sure because it's such a large number, but with six zeros to an inch, I came up with a, a number that's 32 miles long. Okay, so that's how unique your body is, okay? So some people will say, well, I, I get really good results fasting weekly. And other people say, no, I actually like to do it just once or twice a month. And that's when I feel, that's why it's important to listen to your body. Your body is unique. It will never, ever be created again, okay? So don't, don't even identical twins are gonna be different. We've already found genetic uh, changes just in identical twins. It's like, how is that possible? I don't know the answer to that, but they've already found studies where they showed that identical twins, when they actually did the gene mapping, 
they found out they came from different countries. <laughs> so it's like part of it was like, that is just weird. So uh, there's a lot more learning about the, our genetic makeup, but no, I can tell you absolutely without doubt, your body will never, ever, ever be created again. It's uniquely yours. And that's why it's so important to listen to your body. And no matter what I say or any other doctor says or whatever, you find out what works for you and then you stick with it. Okay. That's really important because yeah. I, all I can do is talk in what I know as a doctor and what we're looking at is generally bell-shaped curves that go like that. Okay. Well, all these people out here are being left out because we're just treating this center section. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't have a problem with fasting one day a week at all. Okay. All right. Um, the last question is, I was always taught that you shouldn't have a zero carb diet. Is this true? Low carb, keto, perhaps yes, but not zero carb. It doesn't really make a lot of difference. Okay. Because the zero carb diet, quite frankly, is going to be the keto diet, but the keto diet just allows a few carbs in but you're still ending up with ketosis. And that's the, the whole point is the ketosis. Our bodies seem to like to burn carbs because it's easy, okay? It's easy to produce energy out of carbs. And so we tend to get a little bit lazy. So getting into ketosis, however you wanna do it with the keto diet, with the Atkins diet, which is a zero carb diet, all the studies that have been coming out show those are not bad diets. And when they first came out, they said, oh, it's horrible, it's high fat. Well, once again, you got to remember if you're eating high bad fats, yes, it's a bad idea. If you're high, eating high good fats, that's a completely different situation. That's why with the butter uh, or actually any animal fat, you want to make sure that they are toxin free. Okay. So grass fed, very important for the butter, not only just for whey, but also for the butter. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions that are burning in your mind, put them in the chat um, or raise your hand or probably just put them in your chat, in the chat. Um, just to be clear, bacon is not a good fat with explanation marks. That was somebody that, that was from Kathy. Um, in reality, if the, if the pig has been fed good foods, good healthy foods, bacon fat would be perfectly fine. Because that's what we used to fry everything in was a pig fat, okay? And then we went into the trans fats after that because the trans fats were cheaper. But yeah, uh, pork rinds, boy, don't, I'm sorry, I grew up on pork rinds. And so, <laughs> and bacon, I don't think there's a, uh, <laughs> well, now let's go back to bacon. We're talking about nitrite filled bacon, okay? Now that's a different story. But if you're just getting uh, salt cured bacon or something like that, that's that's much better for you. But the nitrites in the, that are in the bacon, yeah, that's a problem. The way they process it is a problem. But the fat itself is fine if the animal is fed well and good, clean, healthy food. We raised pigs for the fair. I know, I know. Yeah, you got to feed them clean for sure. Yep. <clears throat> I love that. Okay, Robert, did you have anything that... You were you were wanted and ask some things that were on the slides. Do you want to do that, or should we go ahead and um, and close? Oh, I love duck and turkey bacon. How about those? Those are good, sure. right? Sure. Now, unfortunately, the turkey bacon you can sometimes find some problems with the turkey bacon as well. But I've used both, and and and, and please understand, you can drive yourself crazy, literally crazy, trying to modify your diets to where you're not gonna die. Everybody's gonna die. Okay, let's just bring that up right now. Everybody's gonna die. The idea is to just keep a good quality of life going until you do die. And that was what I tried to do with my patients is keep them healthy. And then if they died, I was happy. But you don't want them to go like this. That's the way that is not a good way to die. So you wanna keep them as healthy as you possibly can until they die, but we're all gonna die. I'm going to die. Something's going to kill me. I, mean, I know that. I'm just wondering what it's going to be. So, but yeah, just don't drive yourself crazy with your diets because really that will kill you faster than anything. Just being driven crazy by thinking, 
I can't eat any. I, what can I eat? Oh my gosh, I'm going to, uh, to the celebration for Thanksgiving in a couple of months. And what am I going to eat? No, you just eat. Okay. And then you realize that there's a label has the products to help you get over that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very great. Jim, did you have any closing thoughts? You unmuted. So I'm like, oh, oh, we'll turn it over to you for a minute. No, no, I just was going to say <clears throat> the label is my repentance pro process <laughs> from if I fall off a wagon, which life occasionally, you know, invites me to do. Um, it certainly is a beautiful way to get back up and put the good nutrition back in. That's that right. also helps solve the, you know, the excess obesity problem in a huge, wonderful way, bringing down our insulin resistance, which creates so many other problems, which you brought up so eloquently on that inflammation. People just do not realize sugar is probably the highest inflammatory product we can put in our body. So if we can eat low glycemic foods, and there's a list anybody can go to on Google and just Google high glycemic means that it is a lot of sugar that gets in the blood sugar into the blood quickly and raises the need for high amounts of insulin. A medium glycemic, and it's got less, and then low glycemic, of course, you're usually down in the good foods anyway, the better foods for you when you get to the low glycemics. I, I enjoy, I, I've taken great notes and a whole bunch of pictures of your, of your uh, slides and learned a great deal. Thank you, Dr. Harper. You're, you're a trove of information that's very, very helpful. My pleasure. Awesome. What a great call. Robert, anything else you have on your mind? I was just curious, uh, Dr. Harper, in your opinion, what is what connection or benefit does the fortitude dealing with stress and how does that affect our ability to address our body composition and okay. ketosis? Well, as all of you are already using it, the adaptogenic herbs were a, a, tr a major state secret in Russia for many, many years. And, and most of you aren't old enough to remember when you, Russia was kicking our butts every single time there was an Olympics. And I was like, what is going on? Why are, why are we losing? And it was because they were using adaptogenic herbs, okay? Yeah. And what adaptogenic herbs do is they help your body deal with any type of stress. And that includes recovery from uh, stressful exercise or whatever, but they were using it and it was a state secret for many years. Uh, and then it finally came out and now all of a sudden anybody can use these things, which is really nice. And there's been, I can't even tell you how many papers have been done on adaptogenic herbs. It's so many that it's, it's pretty impressive but what yeah it just helps your body deal with any type of stress now a couple of those herbs uh do seem maybe well i don't know if i should talk about this or not um uh, well several of those herbs were actually designed for fertility okay just flat out they were designed for fertility and so what does that do then in regards to a, a man's prostate or to whatever. I don't know the answer to that. You have to kind of, once again, this would be an individual situation. It's possible. Maybe it could make a person's prostate swell. Maybe. Uh, but once again, it goes back to an individual basis. Uh, so you'd have to see that. But by and large, most people, I think everybody that I know of that has used them has had a fairly good result with the Fortitude 85 in regards to helping their bodies deal with stress. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I, I'm a six a dayer. I, it's a day, huh? Yeah, yeah. I love it. Two, two, and two. I take two right before I go to sleep at night, and I don't have to take my Tylenol PM anymore or whatever. You know, I would say it just helps me so much. So two, two, and two for me. I now, love it. Remember, it is kind of important to remember. Some people will wake them up, and other people will put them to sleep. Yes, because of the tend to wake them up. Okay. But watch out. Because if, if it puts you to sleep, then you don't want to, you, you don't want to take them during the day. You want to take them at night. And if it keeps you up, don't take them at night, take them during the daytime. Am I like an anomaly? Cause in the day it helps me, but at night it helps me too. I'm not sure. It helps me the same way I can. Okay. Do both. Okay. Perfect. I have to share a quick story about our fortitude 85. I was talking to a 
a young mother who said those Fortitude 85s are saving my child's life. And I says, oh, no, no, no. They're for adults, 18 and over, or 16 at least. Uh, and she says, oh, no, no, it's not that I'm giving them to my child. The mom is taking them, and yeah. I haven't needed to kill them. <laughs> well, that's, so, that's the reason just why be men... aware that it, it does de-stress at cellular level, all the cells. Exactly. That's why, I mean, if men were taking care of babies, we'd be killing all of them. <laughs> <laughs> So I can believe that, but you're right. You brought up a really good point there. And that is we try not to give them to teenagers. And the reason once again is because if those herbs really do what they have been doing for thousands of years, then that's the last thing you want to do to a teenager is ramp that up. Mm -hmm. The hormones. Yeah. Yes. yes, the hormones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Especially my 17 year old boy. He does not need that right now for sure. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Uh, David, I think David had a question. Oh, David. Oh, did he? David Hinton. Uh, I, oh. just, I just noticed on the chat that there was a question about uh, what the difference was between using the burn or a cleanse. Using the burner, the cleanse. Well, how are they? Are they the same? Um, um, I think what they're asking, Dr. Harper, is when you're burning, are you also helping in cleansing the organs? The yes, body? you are. And the, the autophagy is really helpful there. In fact, every cell in your body has tens of thousands of proteins that have been used and are just sitting around like garbage. Okay. And so what the autophagy does is it starts recycling these proteins, breaking them up into the amino acids and reformulating those proteins where they can be utilized once again. So you, our, our cells really are full of garbage sometimes and the autophagy helps so much to kind of clean that garbage out and recycle all those good things that we want. Um, the only other thing we can do is kill cells. Now, killing cells is not bad. We can have cellular death because we, we've got 30 plus trillion cells and creating new cells is pretty easy. We can do that pretty easily. But the problem with that is if you have a, a daughter or if you have a cell that's damaged, it's DNA or whatever, and it's not functioning very old, but it's still capable of reproducing, then when it does reproduce, it produces a daughter cell that is equally damaged. And then all of a sudden you have lots of damaged cells that are accumulating in your body. So it's not a bad thing to kill damaged cells but it's better to not get to that point and just to go through autophagy and get them kind of recycled and brought back up to like tuned up, like just like a car. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Dr. Harper, this is what we do at the end of our calls. Everybody unmutes and they thank you for being on here. And then we do one, two, three, and we say force for good. Because it's our it's our favorite core values. So so we're gonna do four speakers. Go ahead and unmute and then we'll have some announcements after that. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Harper. Yay! Thank you. Ready? We're gonna do one, two, three. Thank you. And a force Thank to be you. reckoned with. Yes. yes.